Jason Farley with the wonderful research at JHU, and I really go to Robert Broski and hematology as well. Give us a summary of the risk right now in America to the thrombosis, the embolism risks that we see out of Denmark. Sure. Well, good morning. Uh, we've known that COVID-19 causes a state of hypercoagulability or blood clots, as you say, uh, since the beginning of the epidemic. We've talked about things, many, many types of things, uh, early MI, including uh, cerebral vascular accidents in patients or stroke in patients with uh, COVID-19. We've seen uh, COVID toe, which is little uh, blood clots that block uh, the blood flow uh, to the vasculature. So we, we know that this causes a state of, of the body's response leading to lots of blood clot formation. Um, this has caused uh, significant disease in the elderly, particularly in those with coexisting comorbidities in the United States uh, as well. We look, and I mentioned Francis Collins of NIH earlier with the key phrase, even in younger people. What is the risk of these hematology events to younger people if they get COVID, which they heal from easily, but nevertheless, they've got blood clot risk? Well, certainly. So anything that ups the, the body's response to infection, uh, particularly the inflammatory responses, can trigger uh, uh, the clotting cascade. And we do see it lower risk in younger individuals uh, with fewer comorbidities. And that risk rises as a, both with, with age as well as underlying disease state. So what we know is that we have seen uh, cases of blood clots in, in younger individuals, although they, are, they remain relatively rare. Tom. Professor, can we talk about the vaccine rollout and just add to this conversation? Europe has a problem right now on the continent, and I don't want to get into the analysis of what has happened in Denmark, but the outcome is pretty clear. The consequences are clear for the continent. There is an issue with vaccine acceptance now and trust in some of these vaccines. Professor, have you seen us bump up against that issue yet in America? Sure. So vaccine hesitancy or, or problems with vaccine acceptance has, has been a problem since the beginning of the pandemic. But we've seen that muted, however, because of lack of vaccine supply. So importantly, right now, queues are really long for COVID-19 vaccine, and people can't uh, find a vaccine even when they qualify. Uh, so importantly, we've seen this response of people not wanting the vaccine or people hesitant to get the vaccine or a wait and see approach has been muted because of the supply issue. And Professor, I think this raises the next question, which is when do we start to bump up against the acceptance issue? And when does that force us to actually get rid of the age caps on who, and can't, who can and who can't have the vaccine and just make it available to everyone? Do you think we're close to that point or not at all? Well, certainly um, this has been a state-by-state -state response in who the categories of are qualified to vaccinate in the United States. And, and quite frankly, there are many individuals who are still in the wings waiting, who are the, the, the waiting and, and, and hopeful uh, to receive the vaccine. Uh, so removing age restrictions, I think, needs to bump up against us pushing into that 80 plus percent of those 65 uh, years of age and older. And in the United States, we're sitting around 60 percent of those in that category. Uh, so I think that we need to continue to focus on our age categories for the, for the short run, probably end of March, beginning of April, depending on the number of shots that we get out into arms, but then begin to think about the expansion of those categories and getting the next round of people uh, with shots in their arms. Jason, in the meantime, John's talked about this a lot, the idea that a number of governors are taking matters into their own hands, as you said, it's state by state, and they're reopening perhaps earlier than health officials would recommend. What do you say to people who push back against health officials' assertions and say there hasn't been enough done to recognize the depression, the suicides, the, uh, the, the violence that you have seen break out that has had real medical impact that has stemmed from some of the shutdowns that continue to be ongoing? Well, certainly. And, and, and as a nurse, you know, we're trained to really think about the consequences of disease, uh, like the ones you're mentioning. So the, the fallout of disease, if you will. I would also add to that that, that the consequences of COVID-19 remain real. And we are seeing lots of positive numbers with increased vaccination, increased amounts of, of herd immunity, if you will, estimates coming out this morning from the New York Times of 40% in the across the United States. That's all good news. 
we also are, are also seeing lots of mental health concerns. And so there's a balancing act. But I would say to them that the CDC just came out with some amazing data on a county by county level as of earlier this week, demonstrating that the earlier you roll back masks, the sooner you repopulate restaurants, the more likely you are to see a greater number of cases resurge. And so we have to further push herd immunity. We have to get more shots in arms before we begin making this, not because we don't understand and recognize the consequences of these diseases, but most importantly, we have to get ahead of the variants.